Starting rolling today with Harry Potter and let's use the correct title. The Sorcerer's Stone? <laughs> what was that? The, the, the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Unless you're Neville and you call it the Phosphorus Stone. Um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I think I asked this the first day of class. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? Show of hands. Most of you. Um, how many of you began reading them when they first came out? Anybody remember? Like in... Uh, no, not 95. 97 is when uh, Philosopher's Stone first came out. Um, so if you started reading them in 97, that's pretty... About as early as you can get in terms of, of when they came out. <clears throat> How many of you know the kind of the backstory of their creation? Okay, a couple of you do. Um, how'd she come up with the idea of Harry Potter? He came to her on a train. He came to her <laughs> on a train. That's a pretty good way of putting it. Um, because think about it. She's on a train ride. She's going from Manchester to London. She is pretty much broke at the time. Uh, she has a daughter. She's unmarried. Um, she had been married before her daughter was born. She was married for like six months. Divorced the guy because he was a jerk. Um, she's on a train ride from Manchester to London. She's pretty much, as I said, poor in one moment, she's just a poor, unwed mother on her way to London. And the next moment, she's still poor, she's still unwed, she's still a mother. But she has an idea, okay? Because at some moment in time, as she's traveling on that train from Manchester to London, this idea of a, an 11-year-old boy who finds out on his 11th birthday that he's a wizard, and that his parents were killed by the most powerful dark wizard who's ever lived. Pops into her mind. Why? Why her? Why not you? I mean, don't you ever think about that? Because you ought to. Where does that kind of creativity come from? It's like, as they're passing through time and space, there's a a bubble in the ether that sticks to her and it misses everybody else. Okay? And the reason I ask, you know, why her, why not me, is she goes from being penniless to 10 years later being what? Richest woman in England. Richest woman in England. She goes from being penniless to being a billionaire. Okay? Worth more than the Queen of England. That's a pretty good story. I mean, <laughs> rags to riches and everything. Yes? I think it was this year she actually is not getting her status anymore because she gave so much to charity. I mean, that's true. She does give much to charity. I think she does still have billionaire status merely, however, because of the ongoing sales. Okay. Um, she went from, you know, being a dabbling writer, she'd never published anything, to being, within five years, the greatest published author in the history of publishing. Okay? That is, within five years of 1997, she went from not having published anything, beginning of 1997, to 2002, to being the published author with the greatest sales of books ever. Okay? I think it was in 2002, 
her books passed the um, one that came out, and if I remember right, it was the sales of that book that put her over the two. When Goblet of Fire, yeah, when Goblet of Fire came out, um, you know, Amazon was still kind of new, 10 years. Uh, but when Goblet of Fire came out, if I remember correctly, it was the first time any book had sold over a million copies before there was a physical book to be held. Pre-orders. Okay. Um, by the time it came out, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, There were over 8 million pre-orders. Okay? And then it sold, not including the 8 million pre-orders, it sold over a million copies in a 24-hour span when it came out on July 17th or something like that of 2007. Okay? Just huge sales. Okay? Why her? <laughs> now, but I, you know, I keep saying that, and I am being somewhat facetious. <clears throat> when, when she finally wrote the first novel, and she got it finished, now, as she was writing the novel, she did get some support. Scottish Humanities Council gave her, if I remember right, it was about a 3,000 um, pound subsidy, because they saw some worth in it. Uh, she started shopping it around to publishers. And kept getting rejections. She had over 20 rejections. Okay. Before an acquisitions editor at Bloomsbury in London said, eh, we'll give it a shot. And they published it. They didn't publish it in a huge print run at the beginning. I think the initial print run was something like, in other words, they didn't think it was going to sell that great, but they'd take a little bet, right? <coughs> Those sold out. And then word started spreading by word of mouth. Because the first two books, this one and Chamber of Secrets, did not have a big marketing budget. It was only with the coming of Prisoner of Azkaban that Bloomsbury, Scholastic in the United States, or Arthur A. Levine in the United States, realized we have a cash cow. We have the, the proverbial goose that laid the golden egg. And that's when they started the really big marketing campaigns. I think it was with the third book that they did the first midnight release. The fourth book, there were midnight releases. Okay, fifth, sixth, and seventh, you know, obviously then um, even greater. Okay. The original title, as I said, you know, let's call it by its original title, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. In England. Why does she name it Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? Wouldn't alchemists originally be considered philosophers? Like, it's kind of a branch of philosophy, but you're getting at the real root of my question. The Philosopher's Stone is real. I don't mean real like it's real like this marker is real. It is a real thing, though, in human culture and history. That is, a thousand years ago, up to today, people thought they could create, or find, the Philosopher's Stone and use it for a variety of things. We'll talk about those things um, somewhat later. And when I said up to today, why? Because the alchemists today still trying to create the Philosopher's Stone. Nobody is trying to create a Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> okay, so how does the American edition get this title? Anybody know? Bastardizing. Bastardizing kind of a thing. Okay, unfortunately, this one isn't Peter Jackson. <laughs> or fortunately for him, I guess. It's his Amer her American editor, Arthur A. Levine of Arthur A. Levine Books. If you look in here, in your book, and you turn the title page um, over to the copyright page, and it's got all this, you know, for all rights reserved, published by Scholastic, Inc. Scholastic, Arthur A. Levine Books, 
because Arthur A. Levine is the first publisher before Scholastic took it on, okay? And he is the American, essentially, <coughs> editor of the books. And when she was in negotiations with Levine, he said, you know, I, I think we need a few changes. For example, we need to change some of the british -isms to Americanisms, like cellotape or cellophane tape. And the American edition gets changed to scotch tape. In other words, they tape. All right? Crisps get changed to potato chips. Okay? At one point in here, there's a, a crisp bag is mentioned, and it gets changed to potato chips. Spectacles gets changed to glasses. Little things like that. And then there are some, a few um, others. By the time you come around to books four, five, six, and seven, those Britishisms aren't changed anymore. They leave them in, okay? Uh, probably because Levine and the other American publishers have finally come to realize, you know, Americans aren't as stupid as we thought they were. <laughs> they, they can actually understand what some of these words are. But he didn't think that Americans would buy a book with the word philosopher in the title. That's why they changed the title. He doesn't think parents are going to buy a book for their that has the word philosophers in it. Because, after all, what is philosophy? Ooh, it's deep. It's heavy thought. It's us. We're just stupid Americans, after all. So he changes it to Sorcerer's Stone. And in doing so, throws out 1,500 years of human Western culture, okay, and as a result, also does what? Or, let me rephrase it, opens the door for what? Okay, what's the difference between philosopher and sorcerer? Magic. Nobody's going to accuse a philosopher of leading your children to Satan. Sorcery, however, because you don't have any Levitical laws. You don't have any laws of the Old Testament telling people to stone philosophers. It's, it's not there. You know, Abraham, or excuse me, Moses didn't say, go find Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle and stone them, or burn them to death, because they're going to lead your children astray. But the Old Testament does have some pretty strong things to say about sorcery, witchcraft, necromancy, calling up the spirits of the dead, all those kinds of things. Well, those are all tied right into that word, sorcery. So there was a huge hue and cry on this side of the Atlantic, when this book came out with this title, because people would say, oh, it's got sorcerers in it. We can't have our little Johnny and Jill, you know, reading that because they'll, you know, go down the primrose lane to Satan and witchcraft and sacrificing babies and stealing kittens and, you know, the whole crazy nine yards. All right? And believe me, I've been teaching these since almost when they came out. Um... And even when people find out I'm a committed Christian, I founded a church here, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, they're like, oh, you're a secret Satan. And I'm like, Kid, go away. Just leave, you know. And I've had, you know, graduate students who, you know, have been married to ministers who have said, Dr. Sherman, I don't see how you can encourage your students to read. And I'm like, read the book before you burn it. If you want to burn it, fine. Read it first and see what the message of the book is. And the reason I say that is because there wasn't a real great deal of problem in the American press, in the American, my terminology, I apologize if I offend you, kind of, I apologize. <laughs> because I, I actually want to offend you a little bit to kind of shake you out of your mentality. Um, 
the wacko right wing community. Okay. And I've said, and I think I've said it here before, I'm about as right wing as you can get. I mean, Genghis Khan's too liberal for me, if you understand who Genghis Khan is, right? <laughs> I'm talking about the wacko right wing fundamentalist religious community for which 90% of life, you know, ought to be banned, okay? <laughs> Many of them did not have a problem until the books became famous. And students wanted to read them in schools, okay? Well, in 2001, J.K. Rowling gave an interview. Okay, now, 2001 is four years after the initial publication of this book. It's after they've really become popular, all right? But in, in 2001, she gave an interview to a reporter with the Vancouver Sun newspaper in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this reporter had heard some things about her. And the, the hue and cry in the United States had already been happening for about a year and a half. Uh, people wanting to ban the books, people literally having burning parties to purchase up copies and, you know, burn them and stuff. Um, and this reporter asked her, you know, are you a Christian? And she wanted to get all the heavy stuff out. And she said, yes. Well, what does that mean? I mean, are you a Christian? And she said, I'm a practicing Christian. She goes to church weekly, okay? Church of Scotland, okay, in Edinburgh. Well, what, is that, what does that mean for your writing? That is, what does your being a Christian mean for Harry Potter? And at that point, it was just the first three novels. The fourth one hadn't come out yet. Okay? And Rowling kind of demurred and said, well, I can't really answer that, because if I answer that, it'll give away the ending. If I answer that, it'll give away the ending. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the ending's going to be, you know, the witches and wizards overtake the muggle world and say, all hell Satan, you know, kind of a... <laughs> no. She says her Christianity is wrapped up, is bound up with the novels. Okay? When I was teaching my... Harry Potter in London course in London in um, 2007. Yeah, 2007. It was the year the final book came out. A writer, a guy who frequently writes for Time Magazine, well, what used to be Time Magazine, um, did an article on the final book that came out after the book was published so that it wouldn't have any spoilers. And the article was titled... <sighs> Tore my shoulder yesterday and I can barely raise my arm. Who dies in the Deathly Hallows? Okay. And his answer wasn't everyone. <laughs> <laughs> His answer was God dies in it deathly. And the article that he wrote, the column that he wrote was actually a column slash interview with J.K. Rowling. And he made this statement to her. You know, that it, it appears God dies in the day, and she's just flabbergasted. She was like, well, he said, he's absent. There's no God. And she said, God is. Okay. She's saying, you think he's absent. Little background. The guy's name, um, as I think I said, was Lev Grossman. He's an atheist. Okay. He's an atheist. What does that say about the world? He assumes God doesn't exist. Okay? So if you assume God doesn't exist, it makes it more difficult to what? Not see God in places that God might. This is our novels written 
by a Christian. Okay. Now, does that mean, in what I'm saying here, does that mean that he, God, the divine, omnipotent, you know, God hovering around in here? No, not at all. Do you see Jesus, Mary, the saints? No. Do, you know, they go to church? No. Is that all relevant? Not really. Not for the discussion of, is God present in not only the seventh book, but the previous six books as well. Okay? So her comment was, he's not as absent as you think. Why? Because he's looking for direct kind of experiences, manifestations, etc. of God. He's looking for the almost the proverbial hand reaching down out of heaven and saving. Has everybody read book seven? Okay, most everybody has. I won't say the last. Say I won't say the name. Saving somebody that you really don't want to die. Okay? I really want to say the name, but I'm not going to say the name, just in case somebody hasn't read the book yet. All right? So you, you get this, you know, this tension between these people who want to burn the books and send J.K. And I'm not kidding about this part. Send J.K. Rowling to hell for leading children into witchcraft and Satanism, okay? I mean, there, there are, I can pull out and show you newspaper articles of groups saying she will burn in hell for what she has written, okay? And groups on the other side who say the books are totally free of any kind of, quote-unquote, spiritual emphasis, so one side saying they're full of it and it's dark, and the other side, another side saying there's nothing there. It's all just light frivolity. Okay, and then there's kind of J.K. Rowling in the middle saying, um, "You're wrong," <laughs> and "You're wrong." So the truth is somewhere in the middle. Okay. Questions, comments. What was, what was your experience when you first read this? How many of you read it as a 10-year-old? Okay, 8-year-old, 9-year-old, 7-year-old, 6-year-old, you know, okay, 7. I'm, I'm not trying to pin down people's ages, you know. Um, what was your experience? Let's say if you read this before you were 13. Talk. Um, starting out, I guess it was just like a basic children's story. It was, like you said, she's a phenomenal storyteller. I mean, that just encaptures. Okay. Uh, when I first read them, I think three of the books had already come out, so just playing catch up on those and then okay. waiting for the new ones. I'll, I'll tell you, when I first read them, I was shopping at Sam's uh, one day, and I had heard about the first the first book. And I heard about it on the way into work one morning. I was listening to NPR. This was back when I still listened to NPR before it got too leftist for me. And they were having a guy who often discussed books, T.R. Reed. Used to be the Hong Kong bureau chief and he moved over and become the London bureau chief for NPR. And he was talking about this new writer, J.K. Rowling. Who's, who's written a couple of really good books about this boy wonder kind of a thing. And what struck me about his brief report was he said, you know, she's not like that staid and stodgy old moralist C.S. Lewis. And he just, I mean, he denigrated Chronicles of Narnia. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, he's crazy kind of a thing. And I thought, well, I'm never going to read those things. I mean, makes that kind of comparison. And then I think that was January of, of um, 98. Later on in that year, um, Chamber of Secrets came out. And I was at Sam's, and they had Chamber of Secrets, Hardback, etc. And then they also had Philosopher's Stone, Sorcerer's Stone. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll pick it up. And I picked up Sorcerer's Stone, and I read, like, the first three paragraphs and thought, Okay, this is good. 
There's, and it was literally in the first three paragraphs or so, I thought, there's more to this than meets the eye. I didn't know what more. I just knew there was more to it than meets the eye. And so I, I stood there for like 20 minutes and I think read the first paragraph, uh, the first chapter, and bought it in the second book. Went home, read it overnight. Because, after all, this book's fluff. I mean, this is easy. It, it does have a little bit of deep stuff, especially when we get towards the end, which is where we'll spend more time. If you can see mine fairly closely, you know, I've got all these dog-eared pages. Those are where I want to make comments, which even though it's fluff, you know, it's about every other page kind of a thing, right? Um, read, it, read Chamber of Secrets. Couldn't wait for the third book to come out, which the third book then came out in 99. Read it, and then we had to wait. You know, what was it, two years before uh, Goblet of Fire came out? So, I mean, I was hooked. And by the end of the first book, I thought, ooh, she is saying a lot in here, especially by the time you get to the last few chapters, okay? So what else were, were your experiences? Well, I, my mom brought it home for me one day from her work, and she I read it, and she was like, read this. It's, she said she had previously tried to get me to read C.S. Lewis, and she's like, read this. It's kind of the same sort of mm -hmm. thing, and I, was, and I didn't like C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. I never even got through the first half of the book. And so I was like, okay, and I just like put it off for a long time, and then I read it, and I was like, this is really fun. And I was only seven, so. <laughs> it was like an escape for me. Um, my mom got remarried when I was in 97, and my little sister and I had never lived with a male figure in the house before, so my sister was having all kinds of like night terrors and just terrified living in the new house. And I picked up this book on a whim, like still in the hard copy, like as soon as it came mm -hmm. to the U.S., and read a chapter to her. And that was like kind of what started our acclimation into the, the new house. And I was hooked after that. Like after the first book, I mean, I've probably read the series 30 times now. I read it constantly. How many of you wanted to go to Hogwarts? <laughs> How many of you kind of thought that as there was a part of your brain that thought Hogwarts was real? <laughs> and they and they had a letter on your 11th birthday. Right? Um, I don't remember if we did it with our eldest, but I know I did it with my second, the middle two. I actually did letters from Hogwarts on like fake par parchment, copied the font. I mean, I got a font from the, oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> green ink, the whole nine yards kind of a, kind of a thing. Um, both realized there isn't really kind of a Hogwarts kind of thing, but oh, they wanted to go. Oh, they, you know. And I think it was my, when her birthday came and went, and no letter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why? Think about Hogwarts for a moment. Why would you really want to go to Hogwarts? Is Hogwarts paradise? Is it perfect? No. Okay, so why would you want to go? <laughs> Potions? Think of think of horrible mass steroids, and you have snake. Well, yeah, it depends on depends on whether you're in Slytherin. If your potions is great, but then what isn't great? Transfiguration, maybe. Okay, even though McGonagall's fair to the nth degree. Unless you're in her house, kind of a thing. <clears throat> okay, so I've I've heard you know it has that escape from what? This world. Are your lives really so bad at ten and eleven that you need escape? Maybe with your with your sister having night terrors. Yeah, that'd be you know pretty horrible. Okay. What about Harry's experience? 
Think about that for a moment. Why does he want to go to Hogwarts? Because he really needed an escape. Because he really needs an escape. Think of his upbringing with the Dursleys. Is he abused? Pretty strong language. He, is he neglected? Yes. Yeah. He's definitely neglected. Could you say he's emotionally abused? Yeah, psychiatrists and psychologists would probably say yes. Okay? But he's not beaten. He's not starved to death. Then, where does he sleep? And covered under the stairs. Now, what do you think of? What do you mentally conjure up? When you think of that phrase, the cupboard under the stairs. I mean, do you get like a, a little... If these are your stairs, do you have like a little two-foot door here and he comes in and cramps in? Because that's not what it's like. I'll, um, I'll try to remember to bring in a, an article I have at home. Um... 11 when I was there. Uh, the home that J.K. Rowling lived in for four or five years in the West Country was put up for sale. Okay, An interesting thing about this house is it, one, has a cupboard under the stairs, Okay, and two, has a trap door down to the cellar. Okay, Both of we see in this novel, okay? And she used to play in the cupboard under the stairs. The people trying to sell it, there's a cow producer, people trying to sell it, we're trying to sell this place, like a three bedroom, one, one bath, you know, stone cottage kind of structure. They're trying to sell it for like 400 million, uh, 400,000 pounds. I mean, it was worth maybe 130, 150,000 pounds, but because of the connection they're trying to sell it for a huge amount when I was there in 2003 they were trying to sell the house that was used for number four privet drive for three and a half thousand pounds it's a duplex okay it's it wasn't even worth at that time a hundred thousand pounds they didn't sell it. so you know Harry has this certain experience that a lot of people understand and a lot of people identify with okay but I think as we're going to see as we kind of go through, his experience isn't really something that can be complete because of how different Harry is. If you have your books, um, let's go ahead and start. Open them up to the first chapter, first page. Okay. And look at that first paragraph. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Okay? So what are we told right there? For the Dursleys, things that are strange or mysterious are nonsense. Nonsense. They make no sense. They are illogical. Well, definition of a mystery is not illogical, but something that cannot be rationally understood. A mystery is not uh, Sherlock Holmes and what Sherlock Holmes does as a profession. He's a detective. He solves whodunits. Mysteries aren't whodunits. Mysteries are things that cannot be rationally understood. Okay? Or rationally explained. All right? Strange is almost kind of in the eye of the beholder because I bet if I told everybody in here, look around, you'd see somebody and you'd think, strange, <laughs> move away from you. I always tell this story. One time when I was teaching, I'd been here, I don't know, four or five years. I was making my way back from KUC. I'd gone down there to check my mail. And I came back, and it was like a period right when there was a break between classes. And there's this huge crush of people coming from Peck Hall heading towards the other side of campus. 
and there's a guy walking essentially the direction I was going from KUC to Peck Hall. Okay, first of all, it was a guy. Okay, and it's this guy, and I said walking, but he wasn't really walking. He was moving from the area around <laughs> Peck Hall or the area of KUC to Peck Hall, and he was wearing, if I remember right, um, like a skin tight white t shirt, a white tutu, okay, um, leggings. A high top, like Converse, okay. Um, his ears were pierced, and he had hanging from his ears um, paper clips, like the big ones. And he had like four or five of them. And he wasn't really walking, as I said, and he wasn't really skipping, but he was just kind of a mixture between a walk and a skip and a sachet, let's say. <laughs> frolicking. Prant, frolicking, maybe... Capering, if you think of, you know, Sam of uh, Gimli, okay, and he's doing this, you know, and there's this mass of people coming the other way, and it's like in the movie Princess Bride, if you're familiar with the scene, when Inigo has Fezzik with him, and he's trying to get to where the man in black is, and he goes, Fezzik, please, and Fezzik, everybody, move, and what happens? Everybody's, you know, it's like parting the Red Sea. Well, this guy's making his way towards Peck Hall, and it's like this mass of people see him and just mysteriously, <laughs> like, I don't want whatever he has to rub off on me. <clears throat> Strange, in other words. So we find out what Mr. Dursley does, and we find out what kind of person Mrs. Dursley is, okay? And then we're told the Dursleys had everything they wanted. So what does that mean? They have everything they wanted. They don't need anything else? What else does it mean? They don't want anything more than sweet, simple life. Okay. Also means they're materialistic. And we find how materialistic they are pretty soon, right? When Dudley's birthday comes up, okay? So we find out about the secret, and we discover, uh, they're over here, the conversation about the potters and such, and we go to page eight. Night has come, there's a cat still sitting on the steps, or on the fence, and a man appears on the corner that the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently you'd have thought he'd just popped out of the ground. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. Okay. His beard goes down to his... You don't see that very often these days, or even in 1997. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak, that is is over the robes that swept the ground in high-heeled buckled boots. This is a man wearing high-heeled. What does that mean? How high? One inch? Or are these like punk bands? Five inch? It was, it was 1700s, wasn't it a fashion for men to wear high <laughs> in the 1700s, okay? His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles. His nose was very long and crooked. His name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus. Anybody know what it means? White. It's Old English for bumblebee. B, B, D, D, umble. Okay? And he arrives there, and he chuckles, and he sees the cat. And he goes on down. He turns all the lights off. He goes on down. He talks to the cat, who turn, turns into McGonagall and such. And they talk for a bit. And page 11. They're talking about, you know, who being gone and such. And McGonagall says, uh, as I say, even if you know who is gone, 
Dumbledore. Surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name. All this you-know-who nonsense. For 11 years, I've been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name. So notice, at the very beginning of the novel, we're told there is something about 11 years. Okay. Voldemort has been... Voldy in power. For 11 years at the beginning of the novel. Well, what's going to then happen? Essentially, 11 years are going to go by. Okay. Not quite, but almost. Because how old is Harry when Dumbledore drops him off? About three months. Okay. In this novel, like he's about three months. Later on, we're going to find out, however, how old is he really? He's about 14 months. So this 11-year kind of cycle that we see. And um, he goes on, and McGon McGonagall says, okay, but you're the only one, you know, who you know who was ever frightened of. And Dumbledore says, I had powers I will never have, only because you're too, well, noble to use them. In other words, Dumbledore says Voldemort had powers I will never have. And how does McGonagall correct him? You do have them. That's what that means. You're too noble to use them. Okay? She doesn't say you're too noble to learn them. You're too noble to actually use them. Okay? And he blushes and stuff. And what do we find out? We find out that Lily and James, whoever they are, are dead. Okay. And McGonagall says, it's true. He could kill all those people, but he couldn't kill a little boy. How in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess. We may never know. In other words... It's a mystery. Okay? It's a mystery. Now, even when we do come to know by the end of book seven, do we really fully know? No. Because there's one question or one issue that is never explained in the course of the novel. And when I say the novel, here, I mean, the course of the story, book one through book seven. Where does the prophecy come from? Not who does it come through. Where does it come from? Rowling never explains the answer to that. Okay? Tolkien kind of explains. When he says, you were meant to have the ring and not by the maker of the ring implies there's some other meaner back there, as we've talked about, okay? Iru Iluvatar. And I was just, by the way, I was just reading something the other day. Not on that link I sent you about words and the searches and stuff you can do and talking stuff. It was something else where um, I think I came across this somewhere in one of Tolkien's letters where Tolkien says... Iru Iluvatar personally sent Gandalf back. That is, when Gandalf tells Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas that he strayed outside of time and thought, okay, it wasn't Manwe who sent Gandalf back from Amman to Middle-earth. It was Iluvatar who essentially said, nah, you're not done yet, you've got to go back. And it was Iluvatar who supercharged his, you know, his starry cells, or however you want to put it, to um, enable him to do what else he needed to do. So, they go on and talk, and Dumbledore says, I'm here to drop off Harry with his aunt and uncle. She's like, no, 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 not them. They're the most muggle-like people you can think of. She goes, you can't. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And he says, it's the best thing for him. I've written them a letter. 
After all, everybody reads letters. She goes, really? You think you can explain all this in a letter? Page 13. These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. What day is it? Anybody know? What day was it Harry's parents died? October 31st. October 31st. 10, 31, 81. Okay. Harry was born 7, 31, 80. Okay. So Harry's parents died on October 31st. What day is it that this conversation is happening? It's the next morning. So it is now 11 1 81. Anybody know what November 1st is? All Hallows Day, or another name for it, All Saints Day. And McGonagall says, Well, I wouldn't be surprised if people from this point on call this Harry Potter Day. What is she doing? She, J.K. Rowling, she is linking that day on the calendar <coughs> and its name with Harry. In other words, there is something saintly about Harry Potter. And if you think I'm just making this all up because I'm a Christian and I'm reading into it, just wait until we get into the novels later on. Because we're going to hear Harry referred to as Saint Potter. My mouth lay. Okay? Draco's going to call him that. Lucius is going to call him. Oh, it's Patronus Potter. Well, what is a Patronus? It's a saint. When Harry learns expecto patronum, what's he saying? I expect a patron? I mean, that's literally what he's saying. Well, what's a patron? Protector? Deliverer? Okay. People have what are called patron saints. Okay. Patron father. Protector kind of a thing there. So she starts early on with the symbolism. Okay. There will be books written about Harry. <laughs> Every child in our world will know his name. Okay, when she says our, what world is she talking about? The wizarding world. Okay, Dumbledore, exactly. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. And I don't know if he means turns there like Linda Blair and the Exorcist, you know, kind of turn, or just... Get him off kilts before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember? No, he'll be better off growing up away from all that. In other words, Dumbledore says he'll be better growing off, growing up ignorant. Okay? She's like, well, okay. And we find out Hagrid's bringing him, and Hagrid comes in, and Hagrid mentions, how does he get there? He borrows that young Sirius's, Sirius Black's bike. Okay? So, we get the next chapter, The Vanishing Glass. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dur Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step. And it is now almost Dudley's birthday. It is Dudley's birthday. Okay. And page 20, we find out about Harry being fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark Harry had always been small and skinny. He looked even smaller and skinnier. Why? Because he wears Dudley's clothes. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, bright green eyes. Glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape. Okay. The British has cellophane tape. Okay. Um, he has a thin scar on his forehead, and his mother or his aunt keeps telling him, In the car when your parents died. Don't ask questions. Okay. And then we find out the next page, it's Dudley's birthday, and he's getting his gifts. Dudley's counting his presents. 36. 
It's two less than last year. Hmm. It's kind of like a dragon. He counts his hoard. Okay. <laughs> 36, that's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's present. See, it's here, this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right, 37 then. And he's red in the face. So he's still one less than last year. Harry sees a tantrum coming on. And Petunia, scenting danger, does... And we'll buy you another two presents while we're out, Dudley. How's that, pumpkin? Two more presents. So we'll end up with one more than last year. Okay. He counted 36. He said that's two less than last year. But he missed that Marge's. So he actually has 37, which is one year. And now Petunia says, we'll buy you two more. Why? Why does she say they'll buy him more presents? Materialistic? Materialistic? Why else? What does Harry see Dudley's about to do? Throw a tantrum. What does Aunt Petunia not want? She doesn't want to deal with a tantrum. Why? Because she's, she's a bad parent. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Because she's a bad parent. Okay. What does she do to stop her son from throwing a tantrum? Does she teach him a moral lesson? No. She appeases him. She gives him what he wants. What happens, okay, and this is a, a theme that will go throughout the novels. I think that J.K. Rowling is trying to teach her readers, whether her readers are children or those children's parents, what happens when parents appease their children. In other words, what happens when parents don't parent? The word parent doesn't mean, you know, almighty being or anything like that. It means to guide. They don't learn the necessary life lessons. Yeah. So if a parent doesn't guide, what happens to the child? The child is guideless. The child is rudderless. The child has no direction. So what is, happens with the child? Well, what do we see physically happen with Dudley? Books one through books five. He gets fatter and fatter and fatter. Like an amoeba, he just spreads outward. <laughs> Why? No direction. And it's in book five, we begin to see some direction. What do the Dursleys do? They put him on a diet. And then he discovers he's good at fighting. And he starts getting buff. And by the book seven, he's muscular, he's powerful. You know, a little bit of guiding has occurred, all right? And we'll see some other things that change Dudley between one and seven, okay? And Vernon thinks this is just great, you know, wants his money's worth, like his father. So they're making their way to the zoo, and I'm going to hit a couple things, and then we're going to jump up some. And what does Harry relate on the way to the zoo. You feel I had a dream about a flying motorcycle. And what does Uncle Vernon do? Nearly crashes. Nearly crashes. Why? There are no such thing as flying motorbikes. Too strange. Well, duh. <laughs> Did Vernon see Hagrid arrive? No. Did, as far as we know, did Dumbledore tell him how Harry arrived? No. But he just says, that's out of the ordinary. It's out of the range of possibilities. And Harry's like, oh, I know. <laughs> I said, it was only a dream. Okay. What are dreams? Strange and mysterious. Where do they come from? Some deep hidden part of the mind which Vernon would just as soon keep locked up, okay? So they go to the zoo. Harry sees the snake. The snake sees Harry. Harry winks at the snake. What does the snake do? Okay, this is really the first example of Rowling not being a good writer. 
She's a fantastic storyteller. Why is it an example of her not being a good writer? Snakes don't have eyelids. Thank you. Snakes don't have eyelids. It's physically impossible to snakes for snakes to wink. This isn't a magical snake. It doesn't conjure up, you know, eyelid aperio, you know, kind of a thing for itself so it can wink at Harry. Okay. She didn't, in other words, she didn't do a little bit of basic background research about boas or any kind of snake for that matter. Okay. So the glass disappears, all hell breaks loose. Harry goes back home. He's sent to, yes. I don't think so. Yeah, it sounds like an internet rumor. Uh, it can't be Nagini. No, because book seven, what's in Nagini? A Horcrux. And Voldemort never lets Nagini <laughs> away from him. Okay. Well, when was Nagini made? Long before this. Then what happens when he loses his body? How does he keep her? Big question. <laughs> you know, what happens to his wand? Does he, you know, stick it in? <laughs> you know, it, it, that's never explained. Okay. Because when he disappears from the Potter house, what should be left there? His wand. And so when Dumbledore arrives, or Hagrid arrives, they should be able to take his wand. Okay, here's where you can get in all kinds of, you know, what ifs. So say you're Dumbledore, you arrive in Godric's Hollow, you go to the Potter home, you find the Potter's dead, Harry alive, and there's Voldemort's wand. What's the first thing you do? Snap that sucker in two. Or like a hundred little pieces to make sure it can never be repaired. I mean, he's the most powerful dark wizard. What's the wand do? It channels the power. Okay. You break his wand. You don't destroy the wizard, but you sure do lessen his power. Okay. She never she never goes into that. She never answers a lot of those kinds of questions. We attempt to answer some questions. How do I put this politely or amicably? I should. Say. She fails spectacularly, okay, um, which we'll talk about later on. So we come to chapter two and we get the letters from no one. Okay, Harry goes and gets the the mail that morning, and he sees a letter to him, Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs. Hmm, that's interesting. For Privet Drive, Little Ween, Surrey. Right? And Dudley's like, Harry's got a letter. Harry's, I've got a letter. He's never gotten a letter before. Okay, So Vernon takes the letter him, says it was addressed to you by mistake. What happens? We're told, page 37, the Dursley's house had four bedrooms. Dudley has two. <laughs> and... Harry suddenly gets moved into the spare bedroom, one of Dudley's. He's no longer in the cupboard under the stairs. He doesn't really know what to do with this big room. Got all of Dudley's broken toys in it. Then the mail arrives the next morning. Harry goes out. There's another one, Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom. What should Dudley, excuse me, what should Vernon know at this point? What should he admit at this point? That there's no stopping it. Defeat. That whoever sent the letters, and he knows who sent the letters, knows exactly what's happening with Harry. And that the letters will not be stopped. So, next morning, what happens? Harry tries to get up early to go get the mail before Vernon can, and he steps on Vernon, who's now asleep in front of the f door. And there's three letters. Okay. On Friday, 12 letters arrive, page 40. Okay. 
They've been pushed under the door, the sides, etc. Saturday, things start to get out of hand. How? Because the letters arrive rolled up inside each of the two dozen eggs that the milkman had handed Aunt Petunia. And now think about this for a moment. Have the eggs been opened? No. It's they crack the eggs and there are letters inside. How the blank do you get a chicken to lay eggs with letters inside? The eggs, okay? Dudley, who wants to talk to you this badly? Harry's like, oh, I have no idea. So what happens? They start coming down the chimney and through the windows, and Vernon goes crazy and they leave. Page 42. Next morning, they're staying the night at the hotel in Cokeworth. There's about a hundred letters at Harry for Harry at the front desk. Page 43. Dudley's gone mad, hasn't he? <laughs> Dudley says to Petunia, and he says some other things. And so they finally go to the hut on the rock in the sea. Okay. Harry watches the time tick away on until his birthday. And right at the stroke of midnight, the door gets banged, bashed in. And we meet Hagrid. Okay. Hagrid tells Harry happy birthday and such, page 49. Harry's like, uh, what are you talking about? When Hagrid says, call me Hagrid, I'm keeper of the keys. You'll know all about Hogwarts, of course. Uh, no. What? You don't know? It's them I should be sorry. I knew you weren't getting your letters, but I never... Sorry, I always fall into a Scottish accent when I do Hagrid. I never thought you wouldn't know about Hogwarts. For crying out loud, did you never wonder where your parents learned it all? And Harry's like, learned what? <laughs> what does he know about his parents? They're dead. <laughs> and they died in a car crash, and what else? Nothing. Has he even ever seen a photograph of his parents? No. Now, just one second. Do you mean to tell me that this boy, this knows nothing about, about anything? Oh, I can do math, you know. <laughs> Harry's like, damn, that totally, you know. <laughs> About our world, I mean. Your world, my world, your parents. What? Dursley? Blimey. You must know. You're famous. Why? <laughs> you don't know, you don't know. And Hagrid, you know, hey, what do I do? <laughs> okay. And Vernon says, stop. You're not going to tell him anything. I forbid you to tell him anything. You never told him. Never the letter Dumbledore left for him. I was there. I saw Dumbledore leave it, Dursley. And you've kept it from him all these years. Kept what? Harry's like, hello? I'm You're a wizard. Excuse me? <laughs> a wizard, of course. A good one, I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit. With a mom and dad like yours, what else would you be? And I reckon it's about time you read your letter. Any ops? Pulls out the letter and gives it to Harry. Okay. Mr. H. Potter, the floor, hut on the rock, the sea. <laughs> and Harry reads the letter. Hagrid sends a letter back to Dumbledore. And Harry's like, um, or Dumbledore, uh, I'll get the name right in just a minute. Vernon says he's not going. Hagrid grunts. I'd like to see a great muggle like you stop him. A muggle, okay? Dumbled, uh, Vernon. We swore when we took him in, we'd put a stop to that rubbish. We swore we'd stamp it out of him. Wizard indeed. Harry, you knew? 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 Of course we knew. How could you not be? My dratted s Oh, she got a letter just like that, disappeared off to that, that school, and came home every vacation with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rots. Lily came home and turned teacups into rats? Is there a problem? Remember what Tolkien says in the essay on fairy stories about the little world that gets created as long as it follows the laws of the world, you can live inside. But when it breaks the laws, 
you are aborted. You're left outside. Okay. At this point, you don't know any laws. Are well, what happens when you get to the Chamber of Secrets? Oops. Or not, sorry, not Chamber of Secrets. Um, Azkaban. Well, yeah, kind of Chamber of Secrets too. But Prisoner of Azkaban even more. Okay. As she writes each successive book, what does she do? She fleshes out more and more the laws of the world. But what does she not do? And this is why I will continually say she's not a great writer like Tolkien is a writer. She's a fantastic storyteller. Very few even come close as storyteller. She does successive novels go back and make sure that what she writes in those novels comports with what she said earlier. Okay. Well, what if uh, Petunia knew that she did that stuff at Hogwarts, and because she was jealous of her, she just talked about what she used to do. Maybe she didn't necessarily get it home, but she was just jealous. Well, I mean that's a possibility, but to arrive at that interpretation, what are you having to do? You're having to strain to get there, because she says she came home every vacation with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rats. Okay. Yeah, we won't talk about the movies. <laughs> so she says, I was the only one who saw her for what she was like. And then we get book seven. <laughs> But for my mother and father, oh no, it was Lily this and Lily that, the witch of the family. Then she met that potter at school, and they left and got married and had, had you. And of course, I knew you'd be just the same, just as strange, just as, as abnormal. And then, if you please, she went and got herself blown up, and we got landed with you. Blown up? What? Car crash. <laughs> oh, dies. Okay. So Hagrid has to tell Harry about how his parents died. And Harry makes him say the word Voldemort. Harry said, can you write it down? No, I can't spell it. Don't make me say it again. Anyway, this, this was about 20 years ago now. Okay, it's 10 years after when Harry was dropped off. Okay, Dumbledore said, I've been telling people for 11 years. He says, um, dark days, Harry. Didn't know who to trust, didn't care, didn't dare get friendly with strange wizards or witches. Terrible things happened. Now jump to book seven. What's happening in book seven? Days, don't know who to trust, terrible things happening. Okay, You're going to see a structure for the novels. Ah, man, <laughs> that really hurt. You're going to see a structure of book one, book seven, book two, book six, book three, book five, and book four. That works kind of like this. Okay. Or one and seven, that is, you see actions in one that have parallels in seven. You see actions in two that have parallels in seven. Scenes, events, things in three that have parallels in five. Four is the only one that kind of stands alone. Why? Because four is the linchpin. These three are like this side of the hinge, and they are the other side of the hinge. And it's on four that the first three lead to, and it's out of four that the last three flow. We see after in book four. Voldemort's back. Okay. The first three are pointing towards his resurrection, and it's flowing from his resurrection in the last three that everything ultimately happens. Okay. So Hagrid tells Harry about his parents, and then Dursley says, I'm 56. Now you listen here, boy. I accept there's something strange about you. Probably nothing a good beating wouldn't have cured. As for all this about your parents, well, they were weirdo. Dang it. All the world's better off without them, in my opinion. 
Ouch. <laughs> Asked for all they got, getting mixed up with these wizarding types. Just what I expected. I always knew they'd come to a sticky end. But Vernon doesn't stop. Okay. So what has he just said? The world's a better place because your parents are dead. Why? Because they were weird. <laughs> they were different. They were abnormal. They were strange. And the Dursleys, after all, we were told in the opening paragraph, don't hold with nonsense. It's for the Dursleys, if it's out of the ordinary, it's not valuable. Okay. How do they want things? How they always have been before. They don't want any kind of change. So, Hagrid goes on and says, some people say Voldemort died, but I'm not... I don't think he did. And that's when Vernon goes on and calls Dumbledore a crackpot old fool. Never insult Albus Dumbledore in front. And he turns his pink, pretty pink umbrella and he zaps Dudley and gives him a pigtail. Okay. So the next morning, he's got to take Harry off. Hagrid has to take Harry off to help him get his supplies. And where do they go? Say those two words really fast. Diagonally. Diagonally. What does that mean? Oh. Out of the norm. Diagonal, as it were, to our muggle experience. Our muggle experience of life is straight on. We see everything from our, I'm assuming you are, sorry, from our muggle perspectives. You have to look at things diagonally. Step outside and look at it and see it differently. It's Tolkien's theory. Okay. Because even when Harry gets the diagonality, does he, does he understand everything he's taught how to see? I mean, when he uses flu powder, where does he end up? Diagon Alley? Mm -mm. Nocturne Alley. Does he say, uh, uh, da, 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 Nocturne Alley? <laughs> and that's what, no. Okay. He has to learn how to see correctly. So they go to Diagon Alley. And he gets all of his things, and, you know, we meet, we meet Professor Quirrell, and Harry asks, page 65, when Hagrid mentions the Ministry of Magic, well, what's the Ministry of Magic do? Yeah, nothing. And Hagrid says, well, the main job is to keep it from the Muggles that there's still witches and wizards up and down the country. It's to keep themselves hidden. Why? Why? Blimey, Harry. Everyone would be wanting magic solutions to their problems. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> okay. Notice. People, muggles, would be wanting magical solutions to their problems. What is Hagrid slash Rowling really saying? People are always looking for the Weasley, easy, Weasley way, easy, easy way, and when he says people would always be looking for magical solutions, what does he really mean? There are no magical solutions to our problems. We might think we can wish upon an evening star, and the blue fairy will come and make everything well for us, but all we're going to be doing is prolonging... What must be done? I mean, think of Frodo, however many times he said in the novel, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And Gandalf says, that's good, you can keep wishing all you want. But you're wishing the ring to be destroyed isn't going to destroy the ring. What's it going to take? Get off your butt and start walking. In other words, you have to do certain things. Jump to book six and seven. Does Harry wish to find the Horcruxes and they magically appear? <laughs> no. 
He has to work. And how does he have to work? Blindly. He doesn't even know where he's looking. Okay? It's a little life lesson that it seems to me J.K. Rowling wants to teach. So he gets all of his stuff, meets a bunch of people. Uh, he goes to die. He goes to Green Gods, page one, uh, page seventy-two. And what do we see? We see, enter stranger, but take heed of what awaits. The sin of greed. Now, the only place you have sin being referred to is in some kind of religious context. That is, a totally secular society would not refer to sin. Albania in the 1950s would not talk about a sin. Why did I say Albania in the 1950s? Because Albania was the total, the most thoroughly atheistic state on the, on the planet. More so even than the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had in their constitution that it, there could be religion. They still allowed the churches to remain open. In Albania, they closed every single church. Okay? So, that's right. Of what awaits the sin of greed? For those who take, but do not earn, must pay most dearly in their turn. So, if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. So, this is Harry's first experience of Gringotts. And they go down, and what does Harry discover? He's rich. He's not just kind of rich. He's filthy, loaded rich. Okay. And they go to the uh, vault for Hagrid to get something. And Harry runs into... Page 78, Harry runs into Malfoy and meets him the first time. And what does our first introduction to Malfoy teach us on 77 and 78? Say that again louder. He's a prude little twit. Prude little twit. Okay. My father's next door buying my book. And mother's up the street looking at wands. And they go on. And he says, Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house. And I must say, I agree. Well, he says his father says it's a crime. How often do first years play for their house? Never. Okay. Last time it was done was how long ago? A hundred years. Okay. Well, no one really knows until they get there, talking about which house they'll be sorted into. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Harry doesn't, Harry doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Okay. And then Harry sees Hagrid, and he knows something that this other boy doesn't. And Harry says he's the gamekeeper. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of a savage. Lives in a hut on the square every now and then. He gets drunk, tries to do magic, ends up setting fire to his bread. I think he's brilliant. Harry, do you? Where are your parents? They're dead. Oh, sorry, but they were our kind. Witch and wizard, Harry says. I don't really think they should let the other in, other sort into you. They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. What's your surname, anyway? You know, and you just want Harry to say Potter. Harry Potter. You know, kind of like Bond. James Bond. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, Harry goes on and talks to Hagrid and such, and he finds out what? He doesn't know anything. He, Harry. He just doesn't know anything. And he thinks, I'm going to be totally screwed when I get there. goes to Ollivander's. And Ollivander's kind of a creepy old bird. <laughs> because what, he, what does he do? You know, he goes up next to Harry, talks about his mother's wand, talks about his father's wand. Okay. And he touches the scar in Harry's head. It's like uh, personal space, you know. <laughs> Nobody touches that. And he says, I'm sorry to say I sold the one that did it, page 83. 13 and a half inches. You, powerful one, very powerful. And in the wrong hands, well, if I'd known what that was.
do, and so he gives Harry his wand. We're going to come back to this, but I just want to get this in in the minute that I have. So what's Voldemort's wand made out of? You and Phoenix. E. Phoenix feather. Okay. What's Harry's wand made out of? Holly and Phoenix feather. What's the difference between you and Holly, other than that they're entire, entirely different plants? What kind of plant is you? It's poisonous. Okay. What about Holly? Not poisonous, but it's a prickly little bugger. <laughs> Okay, Holly is leaves, you know, that look like that. And they have little thorns on them. And they have little red berries. Okay. Start to think symbolism. We'll talk about this more on Tuesday. We'll definitely finish uh, Sorcerer's Stone and